Models like the Cyber Kill Chain and Pyramid of Pain are crucial in cyber threat intelligence as they provide structured frameworks to understand, analyze, and respond to cyber threats. The Cyber Kill Chain, it breaks down an attack into stages, aiding in threat detection and mitigation, while the Pyramid of Pain categorizes indicators of compromise based on their difficulty to change, which as a result, guides us in prioritization and resource allocation for the most effective level of defense. Let's take a deeper look into these models now, and let's start with the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain inside of your lab data folder. The Cyber Kill Chain attempts to compartmentalize an attack into a series of stages that are dependent on the previous stage from being executed. So to understand this a little bit more, let's kind of walk through it together. And we'll start with step one, which is reconnaissance. So this is where attackers are gathering information about the target. They might be searching for public information about the organization's employees, infrastructure, technologies. And this is where they'll utilize things like social media, public databases, who is records. And then once they've got enough information, they start to craft a payload. So we move into the weaponization stage. For example, they might be crafting a very convincing email and it might have a malicious Word or Excel document attached to it that's executed upon opening the email. Then we move into delivery. So this is actually when attackers deliver the weaponized payload to the target. This could involve maybe sending a crafted email to the target's inbox or even directing them to a malicious website. And a common example of this is a phishing email with a link that leads to a fake login page and it might look like the company's internal login page to a resource and the employee doesn't really know any better and they put their credentials in and it actually sends it to the attacker. And then we move to exploitation. So this is when the payload exploits a vulnerability in the target system, for example. Let's say that the recipient software is outdated, has a known vulnerability inside of Excel, it runs a macros, and as it does this, it'll actually spawn a shell that someone can connect to you remotely. And then it gets moved into the installation phase. So now that we've exploited a vulnerability, we move into persistence. And this is where the attacker wants to install something maybe in like the startup or run keys that we've been examining in the previous labs here with APT41, for example. And this allows them to maintain a persistent level of access and control, which takes us to command and control. Here, the attackers are trying to establish communication channels with the compromised system. And this could involve connecting to a remote server controlled by the attacker, enabling them to issue commands and exfiltrate data or even download additional malware and at their own pace, sort of hiding within the noise of the network. And we saw just how noisy a network can be when we were looking at PCAPs inside of Wireshark. And then finally, we move on to the actions on objective stage. And recall back to the industry report that we read from the DBIR that a lot of this is financially motivated, right? So what is really of high value at an organization? That's something confidential. Maybe they can lock up the computers, do a ransomware attack, steal some company data, and then threaten to go public with it unless they receive some money. So all in all, just try to consider that each step really represents a distinct phase of a cyber attack. And understanding these steps help you and your organization implement effective defenses at each stage. If you can do this, hopefully the intention is that you can disrupt and disable your attacker from either carrying out further attacks or at least slowing them down considerably. And again, we're just here to manage and mitigate cyber risk at the end of the day. So a model like this helps us keep in line with what we're spending our time and resources on and also allows us to explain what we're doing to non-technical audiences. Okay, cool. So now let's take a look at another one here of the Pyramid of Pain. And this one isn't so much about attack lifecycle, but this is much more about quality of information. So go and open up the Pyramid of Pain report inside of your lab data folder. And what I've done is I've actually printed out the PDF, the original article back in 2013. Believe it or not, this is, this is pretty old, but it's still highly relevant. And this is back from Friday, March 1st, 2013 by David Bianco. And this is a fantastic model. So let's walk through it together a little bit. And really as a little quick summary before we go through each one, you can consider exactly as he wrote it inside of his initial article, is that this shows the relationship between the types of indicators you might use to detect an adversary's activities and how much pain it will cause them when you're able to deny those indicators to them. So as we can see, hash values, pretty easy, right? Modify a little bit of code and the integrity state of the file changes. And as we saw inside of cryptography, a quick change really drastically changes the hash value of a file. So yes, it's good to look out for hashes, but 
you probably shouldn't trust that as the de facto hash that's always going to be there. Now, moving up, we have IP addresses, and that's also pretty simple. Easy enough these days to get a public IP address from a cloud provider, and internal IP addresses rotate time to time. So that's something else you can't really rely on. Now, moving a little bit more up, we have domain names, which are also pretty simple to get these days. You can grab just about any domain name you can imagine for pennies to dollars. So that's not really going to mess with the threat actor as much either. But now we start getting into the higher tiers, and this is where we start looking at artifacts. And artifacts are harder for the threat actor to work around with if you've been able to identify them, because it can be a little bit outside of their control, such as certain requests over SMB, or patterns of HTTP requests, or even certain registry keys always being modified. If you can identify all of those, well, sure, they can go and change their IP and domain and hash, but now they might need to think about that malware that they spent a lot of money and months developing. It may need to change. And now we start seeing the same thing moving up in these additional tiers. Tools is no different. We as defenders get really good at utilizing tools to do our day jobs and detect threats. Threat actors do the same. So let's look at APT41 that really specialized in team viewer getting inside of a network. Well, say you straight up removed it. Maybe you just don't use it anymore. Well, that really reduces your risk profile from APT41 getting in. And then finally, we have TTPs. And so we saw a lot of that inside of MITRE when we were poking around. And let's just say again with APT41, if spear phishing is their key way in, and you've effectively nullified it, if you prevented all the various ways that spear phishing is going to get in, or drastically reduced it at least, then that's going to make it a lot harder for them to make you a successful target. And honestly, if that's the case, they probably spent a lot of time getting very good at that. And unless they're motivated by something else, which we've seen in the reports, most of it is being motivated by financial needs, they're probably just gonna target someone else. So as you can see, this is a really powerful model to have as a way for you to guide your research. Now, conversely, it also means that getting this information that goes up the pyramid is also just as hard. So while it makes it much more difficult for the threat actor to get in, if you can identify their tracks and prevent them all the way up to TTPs, getting there and discovering everything up to that TTP level is also going to be harder on you and your team. However, it's the highest quality of intelligence if you can obtain this information and put inside of a report. And that should be your guiding principle. Finally, let's take a look at one last model over here. And this one's different because it provides more relativity to your organization. And it's called the diamond model. And we can find that inside of your lab data folder over here, the diamond model in Star Wars. And yes, we're going to look at Star Wars because this is actually a pretty good way to understand how this model works. And as I mentioned, it provides a sense of relevancy to the organization. And this is one of the types of models out there that maps you, the victim, against an adversary as the model itself. Whereas other ones, like if we look at MITRE attack, it's more of a knowledge base to reference TTPs. And the attack lifecycle that we see with Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain, that still doesn't map anything directly to you. You still have to do research. And then similarly with the Pyramid of Pain, it's more like a guiding principle. Now, how the diamond model works, and if we take a look at that over here, we can see that it maps the adversary along with their capabilities and their infrastructure against you, the victim. And we're going to use Star Wars over here because this is easier to understand how this model works. If we look at, let's say, Luke Skywalker as the adversary against Emperor Palpatine, well, we can observe that Luke Skywalker comes from Tatooine. He's part of the Rogue Squadron. We have a general profile on who he is and where he comes from. And we can look at the infrastructure. So the type of T-65 X-Wing that he's flying, he has an R2-D2 astromech droid. But more importantly, his capabilities. First things first, he has the Force, right? So, I mean, it should be apparent at this point that that's a major concern. But more importantly, he has these really powerful proton torpedoes. And how's his aim? Well, <laughs> farmers from Tatooine would shoot Womp Rats for practice that are notoriously hard to hit. So he's got really good aim. And what we have here is a very motivated Luke Skywalker seeking revenge with a powerful fighter craft, excellent targeting, and the Force. And then we have the Death Star, the victim in this scenario, 
that is all but safe except one particular area that would require razor precision, which is the ventilation, and ultimately that triggered the demise of itself in the film. And okay, so how does that relate to you? Well, I hope that story can help you understand that if you map the adversary with their capabilities and their infrastructure against you, the victim, with your environment, it might reveal something of that nature. Maybe not something like the Death Star's ventilation problem, but maybe a gap in your network. Maybe there's something that you didn't really pay attention to, and maybe you just read threat actor reports and industry breach reports and knowledge-based articles, and you followed all the steps, but you didn't really connect it together and piece it up against your network. And that's where something like the Diamond Model can come into play to see how all of that information you gathered is actually relevant to you, and if there's something you missed along the way. For example, we've talked a lot about TeamViewer, but if you really dig into the report, it just so happened to be that they delivered malware through TeamViewer and didn't really compromise TeamViewer itself. So say you switch your remote management tool and went to ConnectWise, maybe they can still transfer malware through that. And that's an example of how something can be missed. Now I'll give credit where credit's due, and this is actually from ThreatConnect.com. They prepared this nice little article over here, and I wanted to walk through it as an example over here of a report for you to look into. And there's a lot of these types of reports out there for you to get better context of what types of models and frameworks we could use in cyber threat intelligence. And that's it for a little glimpse into frameworks and models. There are a lot out there. There's a link inside your lab data folder to look into a GitHub repository that has a bunch more information if you're interested on other types of models and frameworks. But just remember at the end of the day, context is necessary. And that's where you would come in to provide value in cyber threat intelligence is utilize all these frameworks and models, connect all the dots, and then make it actionable, relevant, and timely to your organization.